So let's give like a little bit of a overview because there's still people, even though I've been covering it recently, there's still people that don't understand the the concepts of pass through AR. So I'll let I'll let you maybe uh, put them up to speed, and then we can talk about the pros and cons. Okay. Well, pass through AR is somewhat a fancy way of saying that you put cameras in front of your VR headset. And it sounds so simple. Look, one of the big problems in AR is what we call occlusion. It's, you know, there, there is a guy out there claiming he can do it, and he can't. I know what he's doing. But hard edge occlusion, what occlusion is, is when we put up an f- image in AR, it's always a combine. We you basically take the light from the world and the light from the image, and you combine those two sets of light. So you always get an add. So if your background is bright white and you put up a yellow something on it, you're not even going to get to see it. It'll barely be, it'll be some ghostly image, very faded, very faint. Um, And uh, that's one of the things that Magic Leap says they're addressing, but they got other problems. Uh, But that's basically your problem is we we call it occlusion, uh, a hard edge occlusion, which means what you'd like to be able to do is exactly block the light at the point of the thing. And I'd have to get into all the magic to explain why that's physically not possible. You can do soft edge occlusion where you try to dim it, but then you have the problem that almost all the technologies that do that with speed are, are, are use polarized light. And whenever you say, oh, I need to polarize the light, like I have a polarized thing, like an LCD is pol- uses polarized light, an LCD panel, the first step is to polarize, and any polarizer is going to lose about 60% of the light because it's 50-50 for the polarization, and there's about another 10% loss due to just practical matters of how you make a polarizer. But, you know, you go to the store and buy a polarizer, it's going to pass 60% or so of the light you want uh, through. And so what happens is, is that we don't have any really good way of blocking. The other problem you have is the real world has infinite depth and focus. People don't realize if I put an LCD the si- size of a pixel in front of your eye, you won't see it. Remember, I'd make it black. You, will, you won't even know what happened. A, in, the case of, um, in the case of the Magic Leap 2, their blocking pixels are about a hundred pixels on a side. In other words, I did the I did the math on it, and a blocking pixel was about a hundred times bigger than the pixels in the display. There's no precision. It's an out of focus blur. And when you turn just one of those on, you're only you're one and hardly know what happened. You have to turn a bunch of those on to start blocking light. So it's a very imprecise instrument. As a matter of fact, when they do it with this, you see like a dark halo around the thing. Because if you if you're going to block it, in order to block the light to get to see it, you block out light you don't want to block too because it's so imprecise. It's what we say is that the blocking stuff is out of focus. It's, it's blurry. It, it it's soft. That's why they call it soft edge occlusion. There's no known way for a real world, not a flat bookshelf, but a real world, to do hard edge occlusion. I believe it violates laws of uh, I can't prove that. I'm not an optics guy. I'm an electrical engineer. But everything I'm seeing says that that is impossible. Uh, there are guys who, there's a guy who does it. Uh, there's a University of Arizona paper that talks about doing it. But you'll find they only work for one focus plane. You can take, with a really complicated set of optics, you can bring the light in, have a lens, an autofocus lens focus, and then you, you you can focus it to a, to a place where, uh, you can block that light. Unfortunately, that works for one distance. Now, if you have the real world, the real world, it, all these different distances, you can't do it. The amount of hardware blows up to infinity as soon as you, it, almost instantly. So, um, so everyone says, well, it's easy. We're just going to put a display in front of your eyes and we'll put cameras in there and we'll just mix the real world in. Well, I go to, I have this saying, and I talk about it at the bottom. What's hard with optical AR is easy with pass through AR, but it's also vice versa. In other words, almost everything that's, for example, I don't have to do any work to see the real world in, 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 in pass through AR or optical AR because it's there, <laughs> it's right there. 
You, on the other hand, you have to take it, you're going to take it through a camera. That's your first mistake. <laughs> camera doesn't have the dynamic range of eye. So the camera is going to clip it somehow. And, and even with auto, whatever, it can't, it can't match the dynamic range of the human eye. Secondly, the world is all in depth. It's all got different depths. You're going to bring it in and put it on a display, and it's going to be a fixed depth. So even though something appears to be far away, it's going to not appear to be that way. Another big issue is those cameras are never located exactly in the right place. Because what, what happens is your brain and your visual system knows that those cameras, and I'll, I'll have a thing from, um, actually, let's skip it. Oops, is it there? Yeah, here we go. Very famous guy, uh, Steve Mann. This is from a, a quote from a uh, 2013 paper. He's literally been wearing these things since 1978. Okay. Basically, as long as I've been on. So he's got, what, 40, <laughs> about 43 years of wearing AR headsets. Okay. Pass through AR. Okay. He's been doing it. And one of his comments is the camera situated, uh, okay, in his case, it ha it, he was using one eye because back then you couldn't even think about doing biocular. But it's extremely important, even a slight misalignment, which may seem unimportant, but it produces some strange and unpleasant effects. What's really interesting is after you take the glasses off, you get a new set of play <laughs> strange and unpleasant effects. And if you think about it, and this was a point made by Lynx. People know about Lynx. They're doing a fairly thin... AR. One of their things they said is the reason they're doing that is to get the camera closer to the eye, because the thicker your headset is, the more variance there is between where your eyes are looking and the camera. And what you really want to do, if you were to do it right, is you almost need the cameras on on like gimbals and with six degrees of freedom. So as and looking at your eyes, so every time your eye moves. The camera is going to kind of line up with the direction, your, your vector that your eye is on. So you can imagine a vector coming out of your pupil. You can imagine that camera should stay on the vector. But since the camera is not sitting on your pupil, it's sitting out a distance, it's kind of got to rotate, gotta kind of swivel and everything. So there's some real, there's some serious problems there human-wise. You just don't think about it. it. This is someone I call the grass is greener phenomenon. You know about all the problems. A pa a, you know, we know all the problems of it, but the, but the con list is, is equally or, or almost as uh, larger. So you have a fixed focus of the real world. Now, you could then, I guess, conceive of going in and trying to adjust the focus. But remember, while you're doing all this, time is ticking because we also have the photon to electron to photons. So we have to go from uh, photons in the real world to electrons by the camera back the photons to your eye. That delay starts to make you kind of queasy too. That causes problems. You only typically, though, get one depth of focus. Now, we could talk idealistically. If we want to talk, you know, 50 years or 100 years from now, we can imagine a, a light field camera. So we'll do a light field camera where we'll pick up, we'll have a bazillion cameras up there, and we'll process that stuff fast enough that we can then build a light field display with some kind of resolution. And, do, and then have all super high dynamic depth. Of it. Although it, it might be more than 50 to 100 years before all that happens. So I'm not, I'm not going to be around. Maybe, and I don't think you will be. But th that's the kind of problem that you get into is that if you want to make that image you saw in your headset really appear like the real world, you're a long ways from it with a VR headset. Um, you have orders of magnitude in any display technology known today. You have orders of magnitude less dynamic range than the real world. So brightness, things will still look a little bit like you're looking at a TV set than yeah. you're looking at the real world. Um, your lower resolution typically in the real world, although you can, you know, I do believe the one thing AR is going to do, you know about the, uh, Var Vario. Sorry, I always want to say Vario, but it's Vario. Uh, Barrio, the guys who do the uh, do the foveated display, yeah, I think that's going to go away. I think what's going to happen in the in the super high res is the displays, the flat panel displays, or the so-called direct displays, 
um, they're going to get enough pixel density that they're going to eventually creep in on that. I don't know of anybody who successfully created a moving foveated display. In other words, Vario, when they first came out, and that's like five years ago, I wrote about this five years ago, that I didn't think they were move, they were going to move that thing because that is a really, really, really complicated problem to move display. I know Avagon's been working on that problem too, but it is a hellacious. And there was a company called Iway who was this. Uh, moving that dis- uh, trying to move that little display. I think what's going to happen is you guys, you, when I say you guys, I'm talking about the VR world. <laughs> You're going to get there by just having a high enough resolution. Display. You might need two of them, one for each eye, but they're good. They're, you're, you're getting there. I don't expect that the AR world is going to be, we have the opposite problem. Our resolution is too high. Our pixels, uh, this is another big thing. Magnification comes from mostly, not so much from the optics, but by moving the display closer to the eye. The optics are primarily there to let you focus. There's a little bit of magnification from the optics, but total magnification. Most of the magnification comes by letting you bring the thing closer to your eye. The problem we have in AR is, first of all, we we put our, we have to we can't put the thing really close to the eye. And second of all, and by the way, this is where pancake optics comes in. Uh, this is kind of the pancakes are at the crossover between VR and AR in some ways because of, you're seeing we see here where we see this crossover between the OLED technology. Uh, uh, the micro display, like the OLED technology, kind of creeping into where now you're using small pixels. I don't know what the pixel sizes are using, but see, typically in a in a micro display, you you want the pixels as small as possible. This is also a conflict. Um, like I say, uh, VR, I think you want I think somewhere around 15 microns or so, 15 to 20 microns. You start to get to the point where you can get to 40 pixels per degree with the display using fairly conventional optics. Uh, the, the, the AR or the micro display guys want their pixels below 10. And so we're having the opposite problem. That we're having to try to make those pixels bigger. And unfortunately, we can't put the display where we want to or the optics way. Of, so we end up putting around here and you think complicated, i.e. things like uh, talking about the pancakes. So anyway, we got orders of magnitude more brightness. We've talked about the motion to photon delay. Um, you got imperfect alignment of the camera to the eye. We've talked about that. You know, links went to thin optics, and that's another reason to use pancakes, is to thin that distance, but it's still not perfect. It, it makes it. There are serious problems if you're going to walk out in the room. I mean, one thing I like about Lynx design, Lynx did think about this. They have a fairly small and fairly open thing. But it's quite dangerous um, to, to be walking around a machine floor. I don't think you're ever going to see VR in an unstructured environment, like walking on the Boeing. You're never going to do that with VR. Uh-huh. It's just way too dangerous. There's too many bad things that could happen to you. It's bad enough. You guys, I don't know how many. I'm curious. Let me go in. How many people get hurt playing VR, right? You know, tripping into things, going over stuff. They, they, call, it, uh, they call it VR to the ER. <laughs> <laughs> that, that subset of people that get hurt. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely people that have issues with that. Um, unfortunately, it's gotten to the point where uh, like people are kind of doing it on purpose just to get clicks on the internet. So <laughs> you, you can't oh. tell who's doing it for real anymore or who's actually getting hurt. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So anyway, you got peripheral vision, ambient light is. So anyway, the point is, is that a lot of things in AR are easy. You just changed problems. You didn't solve it. You just moved it. Mm-hmm. So um, let's talk about Lynx. Lynx is one style of very thin AR. Um, I like the guy a lot, uh, Larket. I think, uh, is it Larket? Um, yeah. Anyway, the guy's a really, uh, I, I love entrepreneurs, by the way. I love the, the young entrepreneurial spirit it just drives me it makes me feel makes me feel young <laughs> um i remember those days um but i still somewhat concerned um um with their thing um they don't make these optics this optics is by another company i forgot thin eyes what's that thin eyes i think they're called thin eyes yeah i guess that's it uh well no that's is that the name of the company anyway um that might it's be the a name really of the brand. complicated thing where they they literally have to they basically have a combination 
of refractory and mirror optics molded into this really complicated slug. Um, it's amazing it works at all. Okay, it's a bum. It's kind of a bumblebee, but you wouldn't want to fly in a bumblebee. <laughs> um, a couple of problems are you can see almost right off the bat. You have to waste a lot of your display replicating the image, and on and top of that, you actually get this is a high resolution picture. I don't know if this will come across, but you can actually see I've, I've outlined. You can actually see these seams. They're, they're out of focus and stuff. But when you look in there, you can see these seams. You can actually feel it even in Link's mixed reality video. One thing I did is I freeze framed it. And what happens is, is as he's moving around, you'll see this start flickering pattern. What that is, is it's aliasing or the beating of the camera pixels, uh, kind of beating against what it's seeing as, as it moves around. So what happens is they're kind of like, it, what you find is that this variable resolution, depending upon are you right on, when you're right on these seams, you're blending, and so things are blurry. And it's never perfect, plus you give up a ton of resolution. Um, it's as thin as a pancake. And, oh, it has one other advantage. They get to put the eye camera right dead center. They can literally hide the camera in the center, physical center of the thing, so it's shooting straight into your eye which can be a good thing. There's other companies out there who are doing a lot of work to put the camera around the periphery, maybe with several IR sources uh, to help them out. So they have lots of IR sources, one or two cameras, and then by switching and flickering around, you can figure out where the eye is, uh, which with different precision. But anyway, one thing they do is they do give you vision and all. Um, but they, that, that the image quality is not the greatest. It's, it's, it, it's a lot of sacrifice for that level. Now, I don't think Lynx is not tied, uh, necessarily tied to this design. They could go pancake or other stuff too. There are several guys out there doing pancakes. We've already talked about the eye thing. Oh, here's a little better thing. Maybe on this image, you can kind of see the wiggly, you kind of see this stuff. That's actually where you're in the high resolution part of the whole thing. Uh, what's happening is the 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 display pixel is high enough resolution in these areas. These are your high resolution areas um, where the display pixel is high enough that it beats against the camera that they shot this with, and so you get a little aliasing line. Um, I was wondering what was going on when I watched the video. I'd see these little scintil finally trace down to that and then what oh here's another a bigger view of my these are pictures i took so you kind of see when you're back away from it i mean this is what it looks like it's really big thick thing and uh or really uh thick by you know there's, it's filled with with material mm -hmm. it's actually a combination of a mirror and a lens and then this is what it looks like far away now as you bring your eye in you get an image but these the the kind of seams you get where things are blending together just never go away so I I think it's a good start. I think he's got some he's solving some interesting things, uh, but um, I don't think this optics is where I would go. I think you've given up a lot too because once again going back to how it works, you've got to replicate your image. So you got one display doing the same. Look at here, you got almost the same pixels in four places. So you've really right. cut the resolution display. This, by the way, I'm the, I am I I sometimes I. I am definitely known as a skeptic. Uh, sometimes I say, and I thought about this show where, where basically tell me what you're doing and I'll tell you why. It, uh, you know, I, and that's true for every one of these. I, I hit or at least most of them these days. Um, the other thing that people talk about, though, is, is occlusion. You know, we talked about with AR, occlusion, um, this is like a next to impossible problem. Um, here's an example I did with, uh, or I, I went through the video that um, Lynx provided, and, and you know, people think, well, occlusion's easy. Well, actually, there are different kinds of occlusion. So what I've done here is I've kind of got the hand in front, but it lined up really well. I have the hand in front, but it was kind of, didn't line up too well, like the mask, <laughs> where it tried to block the real world and, and mix in the hand didn't work so well. Uh, you can have the hand in and out, which causes problems. 
The one it does great on uh, that's almost impossible for optical AR with pass-through AR is the hand is completely behind. In other words, it's really easy to draw on top of the world, <laughs> okay? Really hard to, to do that. And part of your problem is in spite of the fact you have a camera and your eye, you have a parallax problem. Parallax is this issue that things different distances at different places are going to be appear to be in different spots. So if you move your eye just a little bit, you get a parallax problem that the actual display is right up on your eye. The camera is off a little bit off angle. And so you've got a problem of how everything doesn't really perfectly line up. Uh, this may this particular here may also be a lot that if you move your hand pretty fast, you're going to get lag in there and see holes and stuff. Uh, turns out that for uh, but yeah, as I said, the one the one case that does great is is that's impossible that's impossible to do well in optical AR is this uh, hand uh, the behind. If you're if you want to put a VR thing. On top of the, of the real world, it works really well because you just replace pixels. Uh, it's more problematical where you want to kind of mix things. Uh, you, you know, you have to when you when you want to put the your thing something on front of, like your hand on front of something, then things get more problematical. So it's not all a piece of cake. Let's just let, let, let's like finish up on the pass through AR stuff a little bit. Um... I mean, we've talked about lenses. We talked a little bit about displays. Um, I guess one thing I want to ask is, it, you know, you're 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 definitely a critic for uh, optical AR, and you gave some criticisms, like the grass is greener topic for pastor AR as well. But if you were to like say, if if you were, I, I know if you probably were at these companies, you would tell companies probably not to devote so much resource to AR in general. But if you had a choice, what do you think could be innovated a lot faster in the next five years, optical AR or pastor AR? Boy, that's tough. <laughs> I, I think it's, you know, I mean, <laughs> part of the reason why I'm somewhat skeptical, I think it's going to be a low. I think you have to move on all. Um, if I handed you a perfect display, if I handed you this ideal micro LED, full color and cost next to nothing and all that, which we're a long ways away from that. Mm -hmm. um, even if I did that, I don't know that there's optics that would get you there in AR. AR is a really hard problem. Right. Um, we haven't really gone into that today because this is not so much a deep dive in AR, but yeah. AR has just got that, that original devil of 20 list or so. There's just so many problems. It's such a hard problem because you're trying to do all this stuff and you're constrained by the wavelengths of light. We have to generate light that humans can see. Well, the pixel size is, um, you know, we're looking at three micron pixels in like LCOS. And that's only like six wave, nominally about six wavelengths of visible light. You know, uh, uh, green is 530 nanometers or half a micron. Light starts doing weird things. See, here's the thing too. As you start to get within 10 wavelengths of light, this thing called diffraction starts eating you alive. I, I just want to end past the AR, but really just in general, like, um, yeah, like, what, what can, can you even imagine? Because we, we've said multiple times that, I mean, these companies are releasing past the AR headsets. Um, they're, that's, that's the big hype. Um, Apple's literally their next big feature line in seven years is going to be a mixed reality headset. Like, what use cases do you think for consumers they're going to do for these devices? Because I know for you, you're a product person, so you're you're that's all that's all you're trying to figure out. So, what do you think? Just opinion stuff. Yeah, well, I'm as I say, I, I mean, I put on my skeptics hat. I think it's going to be a bomb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's 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 they're they're fishing. I think we've got a lot of people chasing each other. Particularly, you got the big boys. It's like. Uh, do you remember the Hyperloop? Remember all the Hyperloop trains? Yeah. Have you been on one? <laughs> no. <laughs> they, don't, they, they, they violate laws of physics. The, the, the Hyperloop is not possible. Um, you you got to break too many laws of physics. And I always say, if you have to break one, um, I don't think that the... I, I, I am not optimistic that... that um, 
that 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 the pass through AR is going to be a, a really successful product. I think it's a VR product. Yeah. It's a VR product with some augmentation. Yeah. Um, you know, Pat, one of the problems we have just this thing about the met, the model of um, pass through AR for games. You know, almost every game I've seen that made any sense was a stick on the wall and shoot it at the game. Coming out of your wall at coming out of your wall and you shoot them with uh, guns are almost always used because people understand them. The, go back to use case. They understand, oh, I point and I fire if I got a controller. Well, they always put a trigger on them. So in spite of all the talk about guns and all, almost every one of these things, because people know aim. If you've got to train somebody at something in a hurry, the easy thing is put up something in front of it and say point a gun and shoot at it. Mm-hmm. Everybody figures that out real quick. Um the problem is, is when you look at every room in the world, every room is different. Right. Your gameplay, if you're thinking as a game writer, VR is so much easier. Yeah. Create the entire world. Create everything. You've got whatever depth you need. I mean, in the case of AR, you know, like a lot of these things, the slam or whatever, they'll tell you, oh, room too big, room not right, can't figure it out, go, go to another room with this. Mm-hmm. Like people can't do, consumers can't sit there and go to another room. Or they, they have a long square room or a rectangular room. So imagine you play basketball where every basketball is different and they had holes in the middle and some had a wall. Okay. You can't play that way. They have, they have furniture in the way, you know. People do not live. There There are very, it's like media rooms and, and projectors. Yeah, there's some really rich people who have media rooms and dedicate a whole room to, me, you know, to project in the days of projectors. Yeah. But that, that ain't most people. That's not a consumer product. That's for rich people. A consumer product, you got to go to a mass. And you ideally, you go to a four-corner. When you look at a cell phone, a cell phone is what they call a four thing. It appeals to kids. You know, phones will appeal, the, 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 the smartphones appeal to kids, grown-ups, <laughs> uh, kids, teenagers, that's right, kids, teenagers, uh, grown-ups, and even old people mm-hmm. use these things. That's a four-corner. That's what it takes to get to a cell phone. That's what it takes to get them. They're kind of people telling each other that this is going to be a big market. You have a guy on stage telling people who want to hear it's going to be a big market, being told it's going to be a big market. It's a lot of rah-rah. I'm not into rah-rah. I'm into how's this going to happen? What's going to make this? What's what's going to make it? And I'm I'm a hard guy. I'm a hardware guy, right. which is a tough place to be, as you as you may know. Hardware is really hard, particularly in the startup world. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 hard stuff.